Hello, Jason. Brent. Hello, everyone. How are you all? Um, I wish I could say it's good to see you, but I can't see you. But uh, it's it's good to be with you, um, especially those who um, uh, I know, and it's good to see you again, I wish. Um, if I haven't met you before, have, we haven't had a chance to chat, please uh, give me a call. I, I'd love to meet you. Um, I'd love to come down to your town and, and, and do some training or, or have a conversation and be helpful to you in any way. Um, and I look forward to getting to know you a little bit. And I ask if you all would do me a little favor. Um, when I look at the screen, I can, uh, when I can see myself on the screen, it's less than an inch big. I mean, and I can't, I, I can barely see myself. And so, you know, I'm concerned that, you know, I might get that little foamy thing in the side of my mouth or something, and I'll never know. <laughs> so you have to let me know, okay? Just somebody put in the chat and say, Brent, wipe that gross stuff off your mouth or whatever. Uh, I'd really appreciate that. Um, I'm here to talk about the uh, the legislative update as far as uh, as far as we were able to follow it and as far as we were able to keep track of what happened this year in the recent legislative session. I have some some good stories. Um, I hope um, the beautiful part about this particular webinar is is when we talk about what happened at the legislature, we get to deal in uh, rumors and innuendo as much as we possibly can. Um, and so, you know, um, as an attorney, we like to deal with facts mostly, but Today I'm going to spread stories and stuff like that, and hopefully we can uh, enjoy ourselves plus learn a little bit about what happened. Um, if there are any legislators out there who are watching, I just want to start by thanking you for your good work. I mean, I don't know how many of you folks uh, spend a lot of time up on the uh, up on the hill during the legislative session, but it is crazy. It's a crazy place with with a lot going on, and and I watched these legislators up there. And the amount of work they have to do um, in order to do their jobs right is just tremendous. And they're just so conscientious generally. They really want to do what's right. They really want to follow their conscience. And uh, I mean, that's really where the rubber hits the road. And um, I just, I admire them and I congratulate them for a successful session and, and so forth. Uh, now that we've got that out of the way, though, um, you'll have to forgive me if I occasionally sound a little cynical about some of the things that happen up there as well. Um, if you're our legislator and you're watching, please don't take that personally. Um, as we all know, the adage about sausage and legislation, um, if uh, you like sausage, you should never watch it being made, and the same goes for legislation. There's some truth to that. But uh, that should detract from, from my admiration and, and so forth for the legislators that are there. Um, I have uh, I have a handout that I believe Jason was able to uh, email and and uh, I don't know Jason are these folks able to bring that hand up handout up on their screens you know if uh, you should have a box that has come up that that uh, is asking you to to take the control of the presentation do you see that um, should say ask you're, Doug ask, to, you're asking to me for accept. something way beyond my technological <laughs> abilities. Ask Doug if, uh, just to to accept the presenter role. Accept the presenter role. That's what he asked me to ask you to do. Should be. I'm, a, I'm here to talk. I'm here. I'm not here to click. There should be a box. There we go. Now it's doing it. It'll take just a second there. And Doug, and, and if you can ask Doug to bring that document up. Could you bring this document up on the screen so that folks can kind of follow along up there? He wants to know where it is. Uh, it looks like it's, is that the one down on the, on the side? You just open, it's the one I had you open from email there. there. Yes. That's it. That's the one. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Uh, thanks. Thanks, guys. I put together this document for you folks to to, to keep and and to look at. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I tried to keep the, the comments to a minimum. Just you know, just some um, uh, you know some notes about uh, what the various bills are about and so forth. Um, I'm going to kind of talk through these uh, one at a time. Please, uh, if there's questions or you'd like to discuss more, or if you'd like to know more about what happened, let me know. I'm happy to stop anytime and, and, and comment about any of them. Um, 
you know, once I'm done and I move on, if you want to go back to one we've already talked about, please do. Um, I'm, I'm absolutely happy with that. Uh, I'm going to start with HB25, and the reason I'm going to start talking about that one is because that's the one that, that uh, I had to spend the kind of the most time dealing with, and, and I was up on the hill. And here's the story with HB25. It's, it's a pretty simple bill uh, for local governments, both cities and counties. It's one, though, that can be, uh, that can be key and important, um, especially if you have any plans to do eminent domain any time in the future. So what happened is this. Last year, the last legislative session, not the one that just passed, but the one before that, um, someone brought uh, several issues regarding eminent domain and the power of eminent domain uh, sort of to the legislator, legislature's attention. And, and there was a bill, and it was sponsored by Lee Perry. And this bill was going to create pretty sweeping changes to the eminent domain rules, to the rules about uh, who can and cannot do eminent domain and what circumstances they can do it and, and what are the kind of things they would need to do. And it, it met with a lot of objection, as a lot of bills will, and uh, uh, eventually it was killed, um, essentially. There was a little bit that was passed, but it was really not very substantive, uh, and most of it was, was pretty much emaciated, and it kind of died and went away. Well, that happens a lot, so no one gets too excited when that happens, but what was – um, interesting and surprising was uh, when uh, right after the legislative session they started having interim meetings where they meet once a month as a legislature and they try to take care of some business and right at the very first interim meetings the, the political subdivisions committee um, sent out a letter and um, it came as quite a shock especially to me. Um, apparently they got a hold of the stuff from that bill and they wanted to take a, a closer look at it in the interim, but they sort of adopted it as kind of a pet project. Um, and so they sent out this letter, and this letter was very direct, and it said, attention, everybody who's interested, um, we're very concerned about this eminent domain issue and some of these issues that were raised last year, and so we are going to spend time this interim looking at it. As a matter of fact, we are going to schedule time uh, to look at this issue in every interim meeting that we have this year. So. That, you know, that means four or five meetings, and, and they're going to take some of their precious time in every one of those four or five meetings to talk about this eminent domain issue. It's kind of important to them. They were making it very clear that this is a very high priority for them. Well, um, uh, folks who are interested uh, included uh, folks who represent property owners in eminent domain, but also certainly folks from, from uh, entities that do eminent domain, and that includes folks from the League of Cities and Towns, folks from the Association of Counties, um, various uh, uh, folks from UDOT, folks from Rocky Mountain Power, um, and there was kind of a look of panic on everyone's face because the legislature, the legislative committee made it clear that they were going to take this issue a moment. So what we did is we sort of hastily formed a working group and got together and started holding meetings during the interim, and I was asked because of my role sort of as a, as a neutral to, to lead that group. And we began going through the list of items that the legislature wanted to talk about. Um, really quickly, here's what those items were. First, they were concerned about um, who was uh, on, actually on the ground talking to people trying to take their property. They wanted to make sure that those agents who were out there negotiating with people, they wanted to see if we wanted to maybe license them as, re as realtors or find some other way to uh, enforce the law against them. The second thing they were concerned about was sort of the processes and procedures uh, for doing eminent domain. They wanted to make sure that it was happening fairly and that it was happening in a way that sort of protected the interests and the rights of the property owners. The legislature, you know, they're very concerned about property owners and, and things like eminent domain where, you know, people's property rights are, are uh, you know, in jeopardy, I guess. Um, you know, that is that sets off alarm bells for those folks. Um, the third thing they were concerned about was um, what happens when a government entity, such as UDOT or someone with the power of eminent domain, decides to go ahead and take property without going through the eminent domain process. And the fourth thing they, they were concerned about is, is who can do eminent domain. They, they were uh, all geared up to make a list of entities that could and could not do eminent domain and sort of dole out the power of eminent domain 
uh, sort of like a deck of cards. Well, we took that uh, issue, and I know it's, it's way too late to make a long story short because it's already a long story long. But we took that issue and we started to hash it over. And we met multiple times, and, and every time they had an uh, interim meeting for the committee, we, we came to the committee and presented them with what we discussed. And then we'd go back and we'd work on the next issue and presented them with what we discussed. And the result was HB 25. And that uh, was what came out of our interim meetings. That's what was presented to the interim committee. And it went through the legislative session, and it passed very quickly, and it has now become the law. Um, it passed uh, without really any changes, substantive changes from what we did out of committee. So, long story, here's the result. If your community uh, decides to do eminent domain, even if it's a small action, uh, whether it's to widen the road, whether it's to obtain drainage, um, anything like that. If your community decides to eminent domain, there are certain procedures now that you have to follow that you didn't have to before. Um, mostly they relate to disclosures. Um, there are, uh, before there was just a few disclosures you had to make when you began negotiations with people. Um, now there is a, uh, a long list of disclosures that you have to make. And there, you have to make them within a certain amount of time. Um, for example, if you are a uh, municipality, you cannot do eminent domain, and you probably know this, you cannot do eminent domain until you've had a, a council meeting and the council has authorized eminent domain. You have to make these disclosures prior to that meeting, a certain amount of time prior to that meeting. Um, and they also have to be made a certain amount of time prior to filing eminent domain, whether you're a municipality, a county, or, or a uh, utility, you have to make these disclosures. These disclosures include uh, a discussion about just compensation. They include a discussion about appraisals. Uh, they include information about my office and seeking help from my office. Um, they, uh, uh, there's a list of them, and they're in the statute now. Um, I have, uh, my office has prepared sort of a tongue-in-cheek letter that we call the Heartless Monster Letter. And you'll kind of see that on that form. The Heartless Monster letter is a sort of a draft letter that we created from the Heartless Monster Acquisition Company. Uh, and it's a letter that contains these disclosures and, and tries to get these disclosures done on time um, just to kind of provide to people for, exam for a sample of what disclosures are required. So if there's any chance that there, you're going to do eminent domain any time in the future, this law is now in effect, and you need to make these disclosures, and you need to follow this, and if there's any chance you'll have to do this, uh, please uh, give me a call or shoot me an email, um, and I'll send you a copy of the Heartless Monster Letter, and we can talk about these disclosures in detail. My email address, by the way, if you have a pen, is B. Bateman. That's B as in boy, B as in boy, A-T-E-M-A-N, at utah.gov. Just as easy as can be. Um, so. Uh, these disclosures are the first, are the first thing, and they're, they're the thing that we were most interested in. There's also some other aspects to this bill. Um, like, for example, um, if um, someone feels like someone has come onto their property, taken it uh, without using the power of eminent domain where they should have, they haven't compensated them that the government, the county, or the city, or whoever has just come onto their property, that person can now come to my office and request mediation uh, over that issue. They can also request an advisory opinion on the very, very narrow question of whether or not um, that act, um, you know, is an invasion of someone's private property or whether or not the local government entity has had a colorable claim of a right to do that, okay? Um, sometimes disputes happen just because a, uh, a government believes they have a right to come on the property and a property owner believes they don't have a right to come on the property. And you know what? Sometimes the government does have the right to come onto the property, but a dispute still arises. We have now have the statutory authority to look at that question. And the only thing we're asking is, is there a colorable claim that the local government has a right to come onto that property? That claim may pan out. It may not. It's simply a question of whether or not the, the government had that, had a reasonable expectation that they really did have a right to do that. 
Uh, and if they, if we find that they didn't, the, the government has time at that point to take action to decide to get off the property or purchase the property or whatever they need to do. So, ben, could you uh, give us a definition of, of a colorable claim? Good question. Um, uh, and it's not a it's not a question that's answered easier easily. It's one of those things that we lawyers like to use to kind of make everything fuzzy, you know, like the reasonable man, you know, or the I know it when I see it kind of thing. But what a colorable claim basically is, is it's a claim that has some thing to back it up, you know. Uh, I believe that I have a right to come onto this property, and the reason why I believe that is because I have a document, it may be 50 years old, but it's a document that says I do, right? Well, you know, that document may have been a forgery or whatever, but we're not getting into that. But that document would at least give you, you know, uh, a reasonable belief that you were able to do that. You could look at someone's straight face, or you may have a belief, um, you may have, you know, some kind of evidence or understanding that that something has been a road for 10 years. I mean, I'm sure we're all familiar with the 10-year road by you statute. You have a road that's been there for 10 years because you have maybe an aerial photograph from the 1950s that shows that the road is there. Uh, you know, then you'd have a reasonable belief or at least a colorable claim that you belong there. It may be that after that is looked into different, deeper, uh, maybe yes, maybe no, who knows, but at least you have some kind of claim backed up by some kind of evidence to uh, justify your your claim that you're there. Great. Does that make sense? We, we had a we had another question along that same line. Uh, the question is, do oil companies have to follow HB 25 as they occupy private property? Uh, I wish. I wish. Um, one of the problems that you have with oil companies, especially these ones that that bring these big pipelines through, and they'll you know uh, out in the Duchesne areas, especially where they'd like to, to bring their pipelines. There's lots of oil out there, and they, they find it, and then they pipe it to someone, you know. Um, these oil companies have certain federal protections. Um, and uh, in my interaction with them, whether or not they're subject to HP 25 or any other section of the Utah Code on eminent domain seems to depend upon their mood, okay? Uh, they want to acquire property, and they want to acquire it as peacefully as, pro as possible. So. Sometimes they will come in with this attitude of, yeah, sure, we'll comply with the law, we'll work with the ombudsman, we'll do what we can, um, uh, until things start to go bad. And then at that point, they'll say, hey, we have federal protection. You know, we don't have to follow Utah law. We're doing this under federal law and so forth. Um, again, that may sound cynical, but that's that's been my experience. The short answer is probably not. Probably, uh, you know, there may be certain circumstances, but probably oil companies. Uh, who are covered by these federal laws probably don't have to follow this law. Hopefully we can get them to anyway to kind of, you know, provide some protections to the property owners. Is that, uh, is that only in a pipeline situation or uh, uh, just doing uh, exploration uh, work? Sorry to go down that road any further, but just for no, clarification. That, that's actually a great question, and it really is only in a pipeline situation, but of course, if you know the exploration work opens up a whole new can of worms um you know typically uh, the kind of calls that we get at our office is a situation where uh, the oil company has has acquired the mineral rights and some guy is out there farming the land and he wants to farm it and everything and the oil company comes along and says we want to dig you know we want to explore we want to find out what's going here we have the mineral rights the mineral rights basically gives them the right to come and dig and so well, what are you going to do with my field? What's going to happen to my crops? Where am I going to put my cattle? Uh, that kind of stuff. It opens up a whole new uh, can of worms. I'm sure there's some folks uh, out there who, who deal with oil companies a lot more often than I do and probably have a lot deeper understanding. But, but uh, uh, you know, as far as exploration and stuff like that goes, a lot of it's going to depend on whether or not they have the mineral rights. And if they have the mineral rights, uh, they get to dig. And if that's the case, wow, that just causes all sorts of conflicts and problems. Great. Thanks. That's a great really appreciate that clarification. Um, I think that about covers HB 25. Uh, it passed quickly um, because of the work we did in the summer. Uh, one takeaway that we took from that is, look, you know what? Um, you know, if we do our homework, we can hopefully pass a law that we can all agree to. We had this large group, and, and sometimes the discussion was, was hostile. Sometimes the discussion was very um, passionate, 
Um, but at the end of the day, we actually came up with something that we could all agree to, at least everyone was unhappy about. And so that's usually the sign of a good agreement. Um, uh, but we worked hard and we did our work, and, and because of that, it was able to go through the legislative process pretty quickly. The, the, it did not create huge changes to the law. Uh, there are still a lot of protections in place for, for places that need public systems that need to do eminent domain. The protections for the property owner are also strengthened. And so uh, if you need something like that done, the takeaway from that is do your homework. I mean, start early and get it done, work closely with the legislators, and uh, hopefully have some success. Uh, any Anything more, uh, any other questions about that, you know, please chime in, let me know. Well, questions at next time. And I did, I did email out, or I did send in the chat box Brent's email address, so if you're, if you're uh, interested in contacting him. Thanks, I appreciate that. Um, well, not only will we send you the Heartless Monster letter, which hopefully will give you a little smile, but, but uh, you know, if you're planning to do eminent domain and you don't do it very often, um, uh, you know, consult closely with your attorney and and give us a call. Um, we, uh, you know, uh, it's our job to help everyone on both sides of this equation. We're supposed to protect people's property rights, but one of the ways we do that is by helping uh, local governments understand how to protect people's property rights so that they can behave in ways that they that. And so we will do what we can to help you do eminent domain in a way that, that follows the law. And so please give us a call if you have any any reason to do that. Okay, moving on to the next one. The next thing on my list is um, HB 422. By the way, just as a comment, um, a lot of times we have uh, a lot of noise up at the legislature, especially about land use and, and property law and things like that. Um, despite the fact that, that, you know, I probably spent more time up at the legislature this year than I, than I usually do and that I would ever possibly want to, this was a fairly, fairly quiet year. A lot of things were proposed that didn't pass and we'll talk about those. But uh, what I kind of want to hit on here is a lot of things, it was quiet, but that doesn't mean things didn't happen. I want to talk about a couple of things that you might want to be aware of uh, that, that may have sort of slipped through the cracks you don't know about. Um, and this is one, this one, this uh, HB 422 first substitute is one. This one was passed, it passed fairly easily and unanimously um, and it was, it was fairly quiet, but this one is huge. Uh, the reason why I think this is huge is because um, this is on my list of things that scare your lawyer, okay? Um, you, you probably are aware that in Utah, you know, uh, the citizens have the constitutional right of referendum, which basically means that anything that your city council does or your county commission does, the citizens can put on a ballot and vote and overturn any decision that is made. Um, this is uh, not really ever been a huge problem until recently. And what's happened recently, especially with regard to land use decisions, zoning decisions, and things like that, is there's been some decisions that were made locally and uh, not only did they get on the ballot, but uh, the ballot uh, movement was successful and the decisions did get overturned. That's, uh, although that power has always been there, that has been rare. And at this last election, it actually happened a couple of times in a couple of places. Um, the reason this should scare your lawyer is this. What happens if a developer comes and they uh, ask for a development in your in your uh, town or in your county, and that development application 100% complies with all the rules that you have. Okay, as you probably know, that developer vests at that point. That developer gets to go forward. You work with them. You kind of help them do it in a way that works. But but you know you're you're staying within the law and so forth. But in any event, you you decide to approve them. Well, what happens if that development is unpopular and it gets on ballot and the, the decision is overturned. Well, the result of that is the developer's property rights um, uh, have been violated when that happens. And it's the town that is gonna have to pay the price for that. Um, this is uh, kind of theoretical, um, but not really. Uh, we have at least one case where we know of where a town approved the development, the um, 
the development approval was overturned, and now the town is being sued, and it's being sued for taking and and taking without just compensation. And uh, uh, you know, the town was the town was all for the development. You know, they didn't have any problems. Uh, when it got overturned on the ballot, though, uh, the developer feels like he had some property rights uh, lost, and it feels like he's entitled to compensation for it. And the town's people are not going to pay for that. It's, it's the town that has to pay for that, even though the town really did in, did nothing wrong. Um, it's a tough situation, and, and and you know, as these things tend to get successful, right? As things like um, referendum stuff work why, you know, word gets around and it becomes more and more likely and and the fear is that, you know, you often you have to you have to say yes to unpopular things or have to say yes to things that are with, uh, they're at least disliked by a noisy minority. And uh it's easy to get those kind of things on the ballot. And it's it's easy to portray them however you want to portray them. I'm not accusing anybody of doing that in the past, but it's easy to, to go around and get a petition signed that says Oh yeah, well, uh, sign this petition if you think that we should not increase traffic in our town. You know, when there's the the issue is much deeper than that. But people sign, right? And it gets on the ballot, and then you know people think that they're voting for less traffic when they vote, and what they're really doing is they're taking away some of these property rights. Uh, something that probably scares your lawyer because it's a trend that's sort of increasing and getting kind of ugly. So what? Back to HP 422, what HP 422 did, which I thought was great, was it created a situation where uh, if something like this happens, the local government, the city or the county, have the opportunity to let people know what the potential implications are, and especially what the costs are. Uh, the law previously said if there's a, a referendum or so forth, uh, you know, the local jurisdiction is not allowed to get involved. They're not allowed to fight that or, or make a big fuss about it. Um, the uh, uh, This bill, you know, doesn't really change that. They don't really get to take a position. But they can at least let folks know, okay, which means that if there is potential for takings and there are potential for takings liability, which can be in the, to the millions and millions of dollars, we have cases in Utah. Uh, like that, where the damages have been awarded have been in the tens and, and more millions of dollars. The local government can now um, let people know, say, look, you know what, you overturn this, and that's if that's what you're going to do, that's what you're going to do. But you need to know that if you do that, we're in danger, according to our terms, of, of, of having an unconstitutional taking happen, and the town may be liable for this amount of money. It may result in these kind of taxes being raised and so forth. I think it's really good. It, it it uh it strikes a blow for property rights in my opinion because it 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 leaves in place uh it's solidly in place the citizens' right to legislate through referendum and so forth but uh it at least gives them the information that they need hopefully accurate information to know sort of the implications of what they're doing so that's h b four twenty two uh, it's probably not one that's going to concern very many of you, except for your attorneys, and hopefully your attorneys, after seeing that, breathe in a little sigh of relief. Anything anything about that? Anybody want to make any comments or questions about that before we go on? Uh, I don't have any questions coming in. Um, I just I, I had the thought, uh, so so that could that could relate also to like a residential treatment facility. You have one of these really unpopular things come in. Um, Absolutely. But they've met all they've met all the requirements. Um, commission says yes, go ahead. Comes back as a referendum, and uh, that can give us some exposure. And um, as you know, you know those residential treatment facilities they're they're a huge can of worms, as, you know, as you know, by themselves, and they're always unpopular. And you know the local government doesn't have a whole lot of flexibility as far as approval. Um, uh, as this sort of trend continues, as people start to realize that, hey, you know what, we may be able to stop this, these kind of approvals. We can overturn these approvals through the referendum process. Uh, it's just going to get worse and worse. And, and just being able to get that information out there to let them know the implications of that, I think, is, is going to be huge. It's going to save a lot of taxpayers a lot of money. 
Okay. A couple of questions came in while we were talking there. Uh, Mike asked, could a local government avoid this trap by including a clause in, in development agreements stating that the local government will not be held responsible for the potential results of an, an initiative or referendum? That's interesting. Uh, that's an interesting approach. Um, uh, and I can't really tell you for sure because I've never seen that approach and I've certainly never seen it tested. Frankly, I doubt it. And the reason why I doubt it is because um, the, uh, the right to legislate, the initiative right, uh, the referendum right, is a constitutional right. So is the right to be free from the taking. That's also a constitutional right. Um, uh, there's a, quite a lot of literature on this specific question. Uh, generally, the literature agrees that you cannot contract away a constitutional right. Um, uh, I'm not sure that that's, like I said, that that's been tested and there's cases kind of going both ways. But what you're basically saying is you're saying that, um, you know, if a taking occurs through this process, you know, you have not lost anything or, or you can't, at least you can't hold us responsible for that taking. Um, and, uh, you know, if I was the developer on that side, even if I had that in place, I would test that. I would push that and say, yeah, but a taking is a constitutional right. Um, you know, when I signed this, it meant this. It really, you know, it really didn't go that far, and and uh, I can still foresee a battle, and I can see there being a lot of sympathy for the for the constitutional right over the ability to to waive the constitutional right in a contract. Okay, uh, another question, question. That went along with that. Um, yeah, great question. What is the effect if the council delegates the approval decision to the planning commission? Not exactly sure where we're going with that. Well, no, that's a that's also a great question, and it raises an important distinction that we kind of need to make. Um, the referenda right right now um, only applies to legislative decisions. Uh, legislative decisions are decisions that are made by the council um, or the or the or the county commission. Uh, they're decisions that change the law. So there would be decisions like um, uh, there would be decisions like zoning decision, uh, those kinds of decisions. And the referenda right really only applies to those uh, at this point right now. Um, you know, if you're delegating something to the uh, planning commission, generally the planning commission is only making administrative decisions. Uh, and so far, and that's a big so far, but so far the referenda right doesn't extend that far. Okay. Great. That's all we have on, on that subject. Okay. And thanks for the questions, they're excellent. Uh, the next bill, let's move on. The next bill is HP 220 land use amendments. This really is the only land use bill that was passed. Uh, it's an interesting bill, but it doesn't, doesn't change the world. Uh, you want to be aware of this bill for a couple of reasons, especially if you have a lot of subdivisions in your community, because um, what this bill basically does is it, it tries to simplify and specify a little bit about um, how to make plat amendments and, and the things that you can do to, to sort of make that process easier. Uh, I get a lot of calls in my office about folks, and, and a lot of these calls come from local governments. Um, matter of fact, I had one just like two days ago. Somebody from a local government called me and said, uh, these folks just want to divide their one lot into two lots. And, and you know, we don't want to make them go through the whole plat process. We don't want to have to go through that whole awful process, expensive and costly. We just want to help them divide it. Is there an easy, simple way to do that? And there are some easy, simple ways to do it, but it's kind of muddled. Um, and a lot of it depends on what your local ordinance is saying and so forth. Um, this bill kind of um, uh, attempts to simplify that. Uh, it could go farther, in my opinion, but it attempts to simplify some of the circumstances that happen there. It's worth reading and taking a look at. Um, also, they sort of throw in um, uh, a, a little thing about vesting, about the vesting rule. If you'll remember, the vesting rule is the rule that says that if you apply, if you make a land use application, your land use application complies with the law, uh, you're entitled to approval. You can't change the rules and pull the rug out from under folks. And if you want to talk about that more, let me know. I'm happy to chat about that with you. Um, the interesting thing about what they threw in about vesting is it, it really didn't change the law, but it clarified it. It's, it made it more solid about just what we're talking about. Uh, a developer makes application. You may hear, and you 
probably will hear if you hear more legislative updates or if you look into this particular bill that that um, um, vesting language was inserted in that bill because the Ombudsman's Office made a mistake. Um, and uh, that may or may not be true. Uh, heaven knows that my office has made plenty of mistakes, probably about two-thirds of you out there going, oh, yeah, I know, the Ombudsman's Office has made a lot of mistakes. Um, uh, it, you know, it happens. Um, uh, however, I will say that um, uh, that the, the vesting law, the language that was changed was changed because of an opinion that we made, but the opinion we made, the language we, we adopted that caused this to change came straight out of a case. And so, you know, uh, it probably was a mistake, but if we made a mistake, the courts also made a mistake. But anyway, I, I don't mean to sound defensive or anything. I just want you to know kind of uh, where that came from. It came out of a decision that, that my office made, but my office is very supportive of these changes. Uh, we think that the changes were made were good and were right, the right thing to do. And so um, it just sort of solid, solidifies that and, and helps uh, uh, everyone understand better what happens when people vest and what kind of vesting things go on there. So um, I won't go into any more detail than that on that bill because, um, like I said, it doesn't move the world. But uh, it's worth taking a look at, especially if you have, um, especially if you have a lot of uh, um, plot amendments and things like that that happen in your area. So uh, let's see. Next on my list, I have highway rights of way amendments. This is. Um, this is a bill that I was very happy about. This is another one that kind of came through quietly, um, but uh, I will say that I thought it was a great idea. This bill comes back to the 10-year road by use statute um, that uh, we talked about a second ago and that I'm sure you're familiar with very quickly what it is, is if a, a particular trail or path or road is used by the public as a thoroughfare for a period of 10 years, it becomes a public road. Um, that law has been in the case forever. I'm sure that a lot of you folks, especially county folks, have a lot of roads that were created that way, you know, and, and that's the case, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, what happened, though, is, um, well, the, the short version of the long story is, uh, three or four years ago, there was a case called Oakleberry that came out by the Utah Supreme Court. And they kind of made some modifications to this law with respect to how local property owners can protect that, protect their property from that 10 year period running. What they basically said is if you, if you block the road with the intent to keep people away, sometime within the 10 years, the clock starts over and your road doesn't become public. Um, a couple years after that, right after that case came out, uh, there was a legislative change that was made to this uh, rule that kind of um, uh, clarify and sort of uh, increase the things that you have to do to block the road and protect the road from becoming a thing road by use. Um, uh, and if, by the way, if, if in talking about this, this is not making any sense or you need me to go into more detail about the rules or not. Um, so that passed a few years ago and um, someone took exception to that rule. and. Uh, here's where we get into rumor and innuendo, although it's fairly common knowledge that the party that took exception to that rule was Brigham Young University. And the reason why Brigham Young University took exception to the rule is because every year, uh, apparently on Christmas Day, Brigham Young University closes its campus. They close all its roads, which are used by the public as thoroughfares every single day, except for one, and they close them every year. And the reason why they close them every year and so they will not become public roads under the statute. They also do the same thing to all the LDS church parking lots to keep them from becoming public property. They want to maintain them as private property so they can control what happens there. And one of the things that you had to do in order to uh, preserve your right uh, to private property and not have this road become a public road is you had to have a manned barricade. Um, what this rule did is what this law did is it took out the word manned. So what you have to do now in order to um, keep your 10-year road is you have to have a barricade and the barricade has to stop people, but it doesn't have to be manned. You can just, you can just, you know, block off the road and put, you know, do not enter, no trespassing, 
and actually block it off. You have to actually block people off, um, and there's some still some provisions about um, letting the local jurisdiction know you're going to block it off. I'm sure BYU lets Provo City know every year that they're going to block this road, these roads off, and I'm sure Provo City is just delighted to hear about it, um, and then they close the gates. And so it basically took out the word manned. It, it sort of eased the burden a little bit. From my perspective, um, a property owner ought to be able to protect their private property. If they don't, if they don't do anything to protect their private property in 10 years past, uh, and it becomes a road under the statute, so be it. You know, that's, you know, they should have done something. But they ought to be able to do something if they want to. And, and, and making that a little bit easier by not requiring them to actually man the barricade to me is a is a good thing. So, but it's the BYU rule basically. BYU is it, it came and they made those changes and and as is usual with uh, when those kinds of things are happen, those kind of things happen kind of quietly up on the hill. But it's important to know, especially if you're a county, you have a lot of rural roads. Uh, maybe you have a lot of um, trails where uh, ATVs are passing and they're creating new roads often. Um, uh, you know what people have to do to protect their roads. It's going to be important to you. And so that's why this is something you want to keep an eye on. Does that make sense? Anybody yeah, confused? Was... Much more confused about that than they were before anyway? No, I think that was great. I don't see any questions coming in. All right. I'm sure if uh, if anybody's still awake out there, they'll let us know. <laughs> um, HB 44 is what's next, and we're going to just kind of whip through the rest of these kind of quickly. HB 44 was a, a big one in the news, the Interstate Electric Transmission Lines, and it's a big one in the news. And it was one of those bills that was created by a story, the story being that the very large transmission lines were passing through the state of Utah. And at first, this particular bill was a land use bill. Uh, and it was a land use bill up until one of the last days. And when I say a land use bill, what that means is that um, – if transmission lines were coming through uh, a local area, a county or a city, uh, that uh, this bill was going to make them do certain things in order to uh, get uh, conditional use permits or land use approval to do those things. And so anybody who did land use approvals, especially for power lines or anything like that, needed to be aware of this bill and what it does. And um, because it, it was kind of, it was kind of putting a burden on the, on um, the power lines and kind of making them have to do several things. And uh, uh, at the very last minute, the, the bill got changed drastically. It is no longer a land use bill. Um, it has nothing to do anything with any kind of approvals. The local government doesn't really have any kind of say in the process. Uh, it now just requires an interstate transmission line to sort of make some disclosures about whether or not they have extra space uh, to uh, carry extra power. So it was a big land use bill. It was all over the news. It was one that kind of made a lot of noise, and at the end, it, it kind of it ended quiet. Um, and it's no longer a land use bill. So if you do a lot of land use work, then you know you don't need to be concerned about that one so much. Uh, and now we get into bills that 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 we are put up here as is what I call failed bills, I mean, whether or not. That sounds pejorative, like they failed for any particular reason. It's not meant to. It's just bills that did not pass. Um, the Public Waters Access Act, I'm sure you're all familiar, especially in the more rural areas with the, with that and the implications of that. That bill has been brought to the legislature multiple years in a row and um, never really gets a hearing, never gets anywhere. Um, it never even makes it out of rules, even though it's all, usually all over the paper, even though there's lots of rallies. It just sort of sits there and, and dies a slow, painful, and agonizing death. Um, uh, I will tell you that from my office's perspective, we do have some concerns about this bill. Uh, the reason why is because if my job is to help protect people's property rights, um, then my job is to be concerned about whether or not a bill is um, giving people authorization to trespass on other people's property. And, uh, you know, uh, traveling through the water and so forth, I'm not concerned about that. But when, you know, people get out and they're walking all over people's property to portage or to, to move around and they have a, a legal right to do that, I'm concerned about the takings implications of that. 
But having said that, you know, it's never come up because the bill never gets anywhere. Eminent domain and public recreation <laughs> is an interesting bill um, because somebody um, in the state of Utah decided they wanted to do eminent domain for a golf course, or at least that was the rumor that went around. I don't know if they were actually really going to do that, but they were going to do eminent domain for a golf course. And um, it seems that the party whose property was going to be taken for the 15th hole was uh, closely related to a legislator or a former legislator. And so that person made a few calls, and, and then that person made a few calls, and the next thing you know, there's a bill traveling through um, saying you cannot do eminent domain for a golf course. Uh, interesting thing about that is that bill was very popular. Legislators loved it. It was a, you know, a huge group hug every time they talked about that bill, uh, but it died. Um, uh, also interesting about it is the fact that, in my personal opinion, it probably wasn't necessary. I have my strong doubts whether or not eminent domain can be used for a golf course at all anyway. Um, but if the legislators want to clarify that kind of thing, that's certainly within their prerogative. Um, but uh, uh, the takeaway from that is, you know, think long and hard about what you're going to use eminent domain for, because if it if it just doesn't sit right, um, the legislature legislators will will jump onto that as quickly as they can, and uh, we'll run with it. Uh, the same kind of goes for HB 387. This one was um, um, this one was interesting and pretty popular up on the hill. It had to do with with uh, roads, uh, sort of in rural areas. A lot of roads created by use, um, uh, and it was you know everyone was very excited about it, but somehow it just didn't get anywhere. What it was going to do is it was going to say, look, there's a road created by use somewhere. Um, the property owner whose land it passes can ask for and have that road relocated to a more convenient spot. Uh, basically, so if the if the ATV track is going right through some hay field, they can have it located along the edge of the hay field along the ditch, so it doesn't cut the hay field in half. Um, there is a lot more to it than that, um, uh, but uh, that's basically the, the indication of it. I thought it was a pretty good bill. Um, uh, I always like bills that cause people to have to talk and have to sit and try to work out their issues before they become lawsuits and before they become big problems, uh, which I felt like this bill was one. Hopefully it would have resolved a lot of disputes, but it didn't happen. And the last one is one, another one that was all over the news, uh, transportation rights of way safety. Um, apparently, um, Ogden Canyon in particular is a popular place for Bicyclists, as are all the canyons around. I live at American Fork, and I travel up American Fork Canyon a lot, and the road American Fork Canyon is very narrow and windy, and there are always bicycles on there. And occasionally there are pretty bad accidents, and it's, it's sad and scary, and apparently they have the same problem up in Ogden Canyon. And so the idea was, let's make this safer. Let's give the bicyclists a place to ride so that they can ride up the canyon and enjoy themselves and maybe uh, be separated from the traffic and not have to, you know, uh, dodge around the cars, and the cars are dodging around them. Uh, so the whole point of it uh, was to create safety. Well, of course, in order to create a uh, path for the bicycles to travel, someone's property was going to have to be given up. Um, and, uh, you know, they were going to have to do some eminent domain, and any time you want to do eminent domain, people get upset, and any time you mention eminent domain to a legislature, their hackles all raise up, and they get all like this because they don't like it. Um, and so uh, this bill, is, as much as it was going to increase highway safety, the eminent domain spe specter raised its head at the very last minute. The sponsor of the bill, even though the bill was progressing through and, and probably going to pass, the sponsor of the bill withdrew um, in what I thought was a, a good, prudent move. I'm not particularly uh, opposed to using eminent domain for this kind of thing for safety, but what I like about it is the sponsor listened to his constituents and decided uh, to take the take the road that would allow more time and allow him to have better conversations with his constituents. He was concerned about what his constituents wanted, and I think that's what he should do. So anyway, that's interesting. Those are the bills that I was watching, or at least the bills that I was watching that I think were interesting enough to talk about. Um, if uh, there are any other bills 
that are on your mind that you heard about that, that you'd like to hear my comments on, you know, you can type that bill in there and I'll tell you if I have any comments or not on it. Or if you have any questions about this or anything else, uh, you know, uh, ask. I'm happy to talk to you. I, those of you who know me know that I'm happy to, to try to answer any question that, that you might have at any time. Um, that's, you know, that's what I do. Those of you who have never worked with me should know that, that my job is to, to uh, resolve disputes. My job is to solve problems before they become big, before they become lawsuits. Um, uh, I wish I could say that we're always successful in that, but we're passionate about it. Uh, we, we believe in what we do. We care about what we do. I'm a land use log nerd. I love it, and uh, I, I love my job, and I love trying to prevent lawsuits, and I love trying to help people. Uh, and so if there's any any kind of dispute or anything like that you might have, feel free to call me or email me or whatever. I'll do what I can to try to help you. Any questions about any of this, let me know. And if there's any legislation you'd like to have passed, and that legislation is going to require me to spend a lot of time up on the Hill, uh, feel free to call me. Um, I might not take your call because I hate going up there. But, but we'll do what we have to do. All right. Thanks, Brent. We did have a did have a question, or it says any comments on HB 383 that would have required a 2,000, uh, I imagine, foot setback for gravel pits from homes. The bill failed. I will try to tell you if I have any comments about that. And while while he's uh, looking looking that up, just want to let everybody know that we will be uh, emailing out uh, the information uh, this this summary that Brent has put together, um, as well as if if he wants the what monster was it? I can't remember the evil monster, the or heartless uh, monster, heartless, heartless monster, monster. Sorry, <laughs> the heartless put out monster. Put by the letter. heartless monster acquisition company to come and get your land because we want it and you can have it. So we we will uh, we'll email that out to everybody that signed up. We'll also email out a link to the recording of this webinar. So if you want to go back and review uh, what we've talked about today, you can do that at any time. Uh, our other land use webinars that we've done, those recordings are also located on our website at utahtrust.gov. Click on the the training the training link and then onto webinars. And there's a whole list of uh, different webinars that are available. Okay, Brent. Um, HB 383, I really don't have a lot of comments about that because it, it's a bill that, that like many bills, uh, you know, was filed but never went anywhere. It never got past the first reading in the House. Um, the notes that I have on it um, indicate that it, that it sounds like some things that might be a good idea. My guess is, though, that, um, that it, it just raises issues that are two-sided and one side didn't feel like they were being listened to. Probably the um, you know, the gravel folks, you know, they, you know, within 2,000 feet, they were probably, they were probably get, I'm guessing they were saying, you know, that's too much, that's taking up too much of our gravel, we're not going to be able to do that. They, you know, they have lobbyists up there, and those lobbyists are well healed and have the ears of legislators. And what often happens is, you know, the legislator may agree with something, but if they see that there's going to be a big fight, they'll just say, look, let's just wait on this and talk about it some more as we go. And that's my guess as to what happened here. So, but I really haven't heard any rumors or anything about HB 283. Okay, I don't see any more questions uh, in at this point. Um, I've got a question for you, but I think I'll wait until <laughs> wait until after. Um, yeah, don't see anything more coming in. I appreciate everybody uh, signing up for the webinar today and spending some time here, and I and I really appreciate Brent coming in and and spending the time to to give us an update on on what he has seen and, and uh, kind of the direction from the ombudsman's office and and uh, and we really appreciate the partnership that we have have here and uh, just like he said, feel free to to contact him as well as as well as the trust if you have questions. Um, on any of these uh, on any of these issues, and we'll be happy to help wherever we possibly can. Uh, looks like that's it. Thanks, Brent, so Thanks. much. Thanks, everybody. It's good to it's good to talk to you. Please let me know if I can help you in any way. Okay. Thanks, folks.